years briefly here away from the coast and talk horse here a minute. Because it turns out that our, our turtle queen is, is a horsey gal. Some of her best friends have been horses. We read about several of them in the book. And Mary Alice's new book, if you have not read it yet, is set in horse country. The, the hurricane is that, is that natural force of the coast that precipitates mm -hmm. the impetus for the narrative of this, of this book, but it's, it's horse country. Y'all talk about that a minute. Well, you know, it's interesting. We're in different areas. And when I knew I wanted to write about horses, I was chiefly interested in rescue horses because the way the United States is disposing of horses in this country is just deplorable. And I started working with a rescue organization. And I, you know, the way I work and the way I write a book is I don't have a story idea, I have a species. And I go in and I do an academic research, mm -hmm. um, I talk to the experts, and then I get involved with the animal. And I work with the animal for several months. And I think that's unique to the way I can write about a species. So when I started working with the horses, it was up in Tryon area, mm. and it was an organization that worked with rescues. I fed them and brushed them and worked with them for a couple months and just beginning the research. And the story idea usually comes from the animal. And I just trust my instincts, my intuition to glean that. And it wasn't coming. <laughs> and I was getting nervous. So when I did book tour for my book, and I stopped and I came back, and it was August in 2000. 17, and that was when Hurricane Irma hit. So, and I'm PTSD with hurricanes. I really am. I've lived through 20 years of hurricanes, and now I, I go up to North Carolina, I get out. And to make a long story short, I stayed at a horse farm with a woman who I knew, and all these people came up from Florida with their horses. Some were Grand Prix horses, you know, the million dollar horses. Some were um, school horses. A lot of dressage and jumping. And I knew what they were, but I am not, I don't ride much. I know how to ride, but I'm not a horsewoman by any stretch of the imagination. But I slept in the barn over the stables. And during a hurricane, which I love that word, hurricane, <laughs> I was up there in this, in this place, you know, everyone else got cottages and houses, I got the barn. <laughs> and that was the best thing that happened to me. So I'm up there and you're nervous because that hurricane's coming and the news is on, you know, 24 seven. And you don't know what you're listening for, but you think something new is coming. And you're, you're uncomfortable. And there were in this little, it was two story and downstairs was a kitchen and upstairs he slept and you could open up the doors, these big wooden window doors. And downstairs were the seven horses. And you could smell the leather, and you could smell the hay, and there's a barn smell that's so comforting. A clean barn smell. <laughs> and I, I, I remember being alone in this bed with pillows, and during the night, you hear the horses communicate. You know, the, the talking, the kicking of the stalls. And it was a communication that they were having with each other. And it was like a lullaby. And for me, I connected. That's when I connected. And I went downstairs for the, you know, the morning with my coffee. And for the next five days, I fed those horses, brushed them, and they got to know who I was. And they are, like all animals that I've worked with, wild animals, they recognize you. There's, a, there's an instant of connection. And if that hadn't happened, I couldn't have written about them. Because that's a thought. that is what I believe is the soul of any of my stories, is that connection to wildlife. And that's why I, got, I learned a lot about dressage and jumping and that whole world of horsemanship, which is like akin to the dog world or to the turtle world. Any world where people really love that species, they go a little crazy for them. <laughs> and you get into it. And it was a wonderful opportunity to have an eye to another world, which is what I think is when the story starts coming. And when I found out that you were involved with horses too, but in a different way, it still is that connection, don't you think? The 
wanting to protect, but you're more with therapy horses, right? Oh, that, that's what I do. I volunteer once a week at Heroes on Horseback and Bluffton. But no, my deal, when you're dealing dressage and Grand Prix, yeah. that's a whole nother league. It I'm is. nowhere it is. near in that league. It's, it's, I have to say, having learned about it, now that I understand dressage and have watched the lessons and have watched the great horses when they were up in triumph for the world equestrian games, it's like watching Badishnikov dance compared to me, <laughs> you know? And you see, you appreciate the difference. It really is dressage. You learn the fine tuning and that connection between rider and horse is so profound. You think the rider's just sitting, but in fact that communication is going on. And I think it's so beautiful. And it's symbolic of what happens with our dogs and our cats. And when I'm with wildlife, the dolphins rec when I go to the pod in Florida that I work with, the dolphins recognize me before I recognize the names of each one, you know, by the chips of the dorsal fin. And there's they have that connection. And you you, you learn to respect that. So, so go ahead, I'm sorry, I jumped in there. No, I had a, a great situation when I was a kid at Rosedew because a neighbor had a lot of horses. He had kids, I babysat, and my payment was to get to ride the horses anytime I wanted to. So I grew up from about age 10, I got the virus, and it's, it's incurable. Um, and I rode up until I went off to college, junior college at uh, Converse. I mean, not junior college, junior year at Converse. And then there was this long spate where I was in Columbia or on the coast. And when I was living at Pocasabo in Colleton County, and my 40th birthday came around, I went to the owner and I said, I'm going to need a really big present for this really big birthday. And can I get a horse and keep it here? So, so I did. And I had some, I had a off the track thoroughbred for 20 years, and he was wonderful. And I have a little, um, he's not little, he's a big boy, but a quarter horse that's a buckskin, and his name is Dylan. And I didn't name him, but he's named after Sheriff Matt Dillon. Aww. I have a Bernie's Mountain Dog, and that's a small horse. <laughs> now, I don't think I could own a horse at this point in my life. I'm, uh, you know, I love them. Who doesn't love horses? Really, they're iconic in our culture. But I think you either start young, and you, a lot of young, especially girls, girls love horses. They, they develop this, like you said, a virus, yeah. and it's lifelong. But I, I love horses, but I don't need to own one. Isn't that interesting? I think we all, turtles I have to stay with. Well, I don't ride Dylan that much. <laughs> when the grandkids come, they ride him. He's mostly a lawn ornament, but I just love having him there. And we we make eye contact, we communicate. Isn't so that? You've had that with a number of non-marine species in the course of your short life so far. You've had bobcat friends and all manner of critters. Tell us a good critter story. Well, as in the wildlife department, people are also always finding baby animals and bringing them in. And living at Pocasabo, we had 1,700 acres. So it was the perfect place to rehab birds and teach them to fly. When baby birds come, you can't just say, put them out in the woods and say, have a nice life, because they can't even fly it. So we had, um, here's one, we had one owl. It was a great horned owl. And we called him Gar because when we first got him, he was a little fuzzy chick with dark eyes. And he looked like a gargoyle that you'd see on Notre Dame. Or big. People think the baby owls are small. Well, this they? was a little fluff ball. So it must have been quite big. young. Like, but new. then, you know, he got very big, very fast. This big. But he would perch in this door in the living room, and owls just poop straight down. <laughs> Whereas hawks, you know, send it. <laughs> and so he could just put some paper under the door. He was happy. He 
when he started learning to fly, it was a big long gray room, so he'd take off from the gun rack and sail down and land on the back of the sofa. He started tearing up TV guides as a prey. He would land on the TV and tear them up. And we thought, what are we going to do with this bird? And there was a woman in Florida who was on the recovery team. My husband, Tom, was the, the uh, chairman of the Eagle recovery team for the Southeast. And Doris Mager was on that team. And she had a nonprofit <coughs> called SOAR, Save Our American Raptors. Oh, yeah. And she came to Fripp Island one time. And she had a great horned owl that was getting up in age. And so she said she'd love to have Gar. That was, I don't know how many years ago, that had to have been in the 80s, okay? We just heard from Doris that Gar died just last month. Wow. 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 Now, Sam, he flew, he would free fly over auditoriums of children, you know, oh. for oh, like 30 years. I know what a voracious reader you are, and that there's all sorts of reading material around your house, or so I assume. I'm just so curious if Gar was particular to the TV guide, like was he just like, telling us something there? Did he ever go after literary fiction? That was because it was, you know, on the floor on the table, no, not literary fiction. <laughs> the good stuff alone. All right, so things turned up. People brought Critters, critters turned up. Let's go back to the shore. Tell me, both of you, you girls have spent a long, a lot of time up and down the beach, either in planes or hoofing it or whatever. Tell, tell us an interesting thing that perhaps you've come across, floated in, bale shape or anything like that. I mean, tell us what's. Don't tell us a break your heart story quite yet, but tell us something interesting. The, the weirdest thing I ever saw on the beach was whale lungs. It took a while to figure out what it was because it was just this long, big thing, about 15 feet long on the beach. But it was the lungs from a whale. For me, the... Um, we were talking a little bit earlier. The in the early back in the day, you said the turtles when they came up from being drowned, the reptiles, they were perfect, so they were beautiful. Now when we have strandings on the beach, they're usually hit by propellers or their barnacle bills. You know, they just are covered or have turtle flu or they're just not healthy looking. But what's really hard is I'm on the marine mammal stranding as well. Is when you get called for the for the dolphins mm -hmm. and. I worked with the dolphin for six years and have developed a really strong relationship with it. The of all the species I've worked with, I think dolphins and I, dolphins have, the, the intelligence is so, so much there, but also the personality, and they're just, and for so many reasons, I love them. So when I would see a perfect dolphin on the beach, or the young one, maybe just a couple days old, so beautiful, so precious, not a, shark bite or anything on it and I wouldn't know why it died they have to take it away and do a necropsy but that always broke my heart and now to know that microplastics are largely the plastics in the ocean are such a part of killing a lot of these um, mammals which by the way are siblings in the sea they're the sentinel species what happens with dolphins is happening with us as well so we have to keep that in mind but for me, that is the hardest. As far as turtles, it never gets old. I've seen turtle nests emerge hundreds of times. I've written about it a hundred times. But it never gets old. That sense of the group coming out with a, if it's healthy, a boil, and they scatter out. And it's just so beautiful that you want to write about it every single time. And people who see that, become turtle zealots. And we love them, each and every one. And I'm grateful. You know, I think that's the purpose of both our books, uh, all of them, is that we want the people to, who read them to care and to get involved and to learn and to know what I can do to help. I think today that's the big issue. 
When I speak across the country, so many people are, they hear so much from the internet and the news about climate change, and it just seems so big that they are beginning to shut down. And they ask, what can I do? What, what, it's too big. And I think by showing through individual lives, in your case, or through the power of story with characters, you show them how they can make a difference in their own life. To not, my dad used to say, Mary Alice, I was always a zealot, Mary Alice, don't worry about the world. Just light one candle. And I remember thinking he was just an old fuddy-duddy. Daddy, you're just making me, you're trying to get rid of me. Now I realize how wise he was. That he was saying in modern parlance, think globally, but act locally. What can you do in your own life, right this today, to light one candle? And that's how we can make a difference. We really can. And that's how turtle ladies have made a difference. <laughs> Tell about the last 30 years, the trending upward in this. Because you were there. Well, the when I first started working on Cape Island, this was in the mid '70s, and yeah, they had 2,000 nests on Cape Island this past year. But when I started, there were 2,000 nests on Cape Island, and it went down, down, down until I think their lowest number was down around 900 one year. And I have a very brilliant colleague in Queensland, Australia, Dr. Colin Lumpus. And he has done so much to advance turtle research that it's amazing. He invented the turtle rodeo, where you run around in a little speedboat with some idiot on the front and somebody else driving it, and the water's clear on the reef flats. And then you see a turtle underwater and you take, chase it down and the guy in the front jumps off the boat at full speed and catches the turtle. We did that with dolphins. <laughs> <laughs> he, by doing that, he was able to tag those turtles, catch them year after year. And the other thing he invented was a laparoscopy for turtles. He would turn them upside down, go in at the groin and use a laparoscopy and he could tell whether it was a male or female, because when they're juveniles, you can't tell externally. He would know, he watched the same turtle he caught time and time again go through puberty. It took seven years. And then he can tell looking at the ovaries or the sperm duck if they're gonna nest in the coming season. So all this, nobody else was doing that. And he told me, he enacted Ted's in Queensland without all the hubbub I had to go through. And he said there was like an eight year lag time where you see the Ted's go in and eight years later his loggerhead population start to increase. With the turtle ladies on the beach, well, yeah, we're pumping hatchlings out there like crazy. But it's a 30 year lag time before you're going to see any change in the population because that's how long it takes a female to grow up and nest for the first time. And, and the, the way we knew that is the same person in Queensland. He had a beach at Monrepo, which is near Bundaberg, and they would dig a trench <coughs> across the beach and every hatchling that came out fell into it. And he had volunteers that clipped tiny little notches in the rear marginal scoots of those hatchlings. And that marked them, just like a flipper tag, only it was there to stay. And over the years, he waited for those marked turtles to come back to Mon Repo. And he waited. And we thought then they matured in eight to 10 years. And he waited, <laughs> then we thought it took 12 to 15 years. And he's getting gray, his kids are growing up. And finally, at 29 years, the first turtle came back. Wow. And since then, he's gotten 13 or so. So that's how we know that it takes 30 years. So there's been huge advances in turtle science coming out of Queensland. But 
But that, I think the point that we should take hope from, and I think is that we need hope, we do today, is that since the 30 years since you've begun incorporating the teens, and that we have increased the number of hatchlings that get safely to the sea, we meaning the volunteers that work every day quietly just because they love the animals. Now we're seeing a trend upward, and I do believe it's because of what's going on on the beaches. But Sally's point is well taken, that it's the death of a mature female after 29 years that's just a, a heartbreaker, because that's gold. That's, that's the future, is when we lose those. But we could talk to her. Obviously, long time. <laughs> so, but success, <laughs> hope, as Mary Alice says, yes. with our bald eagles in these parks, there, right. there is another success story. Your husband, Tom, is part of that success story. So there is hope, but oh, wise woman of <laughs> facts. Mary Alice talks about lighting that one candle. What's the best way? You know the science. You know the facts. You know these marshes and rivers. How do we light the candle here in the Low Country? Well, I'm not sure about the Low Country, but what gives me hope is when you have the annual International Sea <coughs> Turtle Society have its uh, meeting and symposium in different parts of the world. And this past February, it was in Charleston. And when you see over a thousand people coming to a turtle meeting from 80 different countries, and their students, their granny grumps in tennis shoes, their academics, their feds, their state people, their NGOs, that's what gives me hope. Over a thousand people that travel from around the world, Africa, Philippines, Japan, Greece, everywhere. That's what gives me hope. That is cause for hope. But we're feeling better about the turtles. We're feeling better about the eagles. Who needs the candle lit now? What, Everybody. What I think you, you can't be naive about kind. what's going on in the world. I think this is um, global. All species, birds, all species are being affected. And I believe that you choose the one thing that you can do in your life, whether it's not using plastic straws, or trying to make a difference with recycling, or join your community and find out what you can do to help your own community. Uh, and of course, voting. I, I do believe that the power of the future for our, not us, I'm an old woman. I've lived a good life. But I have children and grandchildren. It's for them. That's where we have to have our eye. That's the, it's our children's future. And what's going on right now with sea rising is for real. We're on the coast here, people. It's for real. And we're going, we see the hurricanes. I'm not doom and gloom. I'm saying pay attention. I'm the canary in the coal mine. Every book that I write is my song. It's lighting. It's to show you an opportunity to fall in love with another species. And I hope that when you do, you will find that you want to take care in your own way, what you can do to light your candle. And that is hope, because there is time to make a difference, but we have to act now. And I'm using this, this platform because that's what my books are. I tell, no one reads my books to learn about the environment. I tell a good story. It's the Rutledge family, or whatever family struggle I'm involved in. But what I do with literature is what you do on the field, is we're trying to make a difference to save species, to save the planet. And that's your job too. Not just Sally's and mine. It's your job too. We can all join in together. Because if I light a candle, and you light a candle, and you light a candle, and you light a candle, we all light candles. That's illumination. And we can make a difference. <coughs> I believe this passionately. So tell us about candle, each of you. That you're. What's what's the next candle to light? What are, what's your next? Well, I, I retired. <laughs> I don't get in airplanes anymore. I've had too many close calls to do that. 
single engine airplanes and helicopters. You don't want to do. Um, but here in Beaufort County, I've tried to make a difference. And you might remember five years or so ago, there was this big, big hubbub about cannon jelly balls being manufactured and pickled here and whatever. I was in the midst of that fight, hmm. along with some very smart people at Dato Allen. And I just try to do that. I can't do it globally anymore, but um, just this past Sunday, you might have seen my letter to the editor in the Beaufort Gazette. You go, girl. <laughs> yep. About the insanity of developing Bay Point. Exactly. So that's what I do. I jump into the fray just here. I've sort of shrunk my realm a bit. So it's, it's handleable, but it's worth doing. And how about for Sally herself? Not necessarily lighting the candle for the wide world, but what's now that you have been retired for a few years and you're out there in your, in your peaceful situation, what is the, what's fun? Sitting on my porch, looking out at the marsh, watching the tide come in, watching spoonbills now. We have spoonbills. I am so thrilled. Yeah. And um, I love those. If you've okay. never heard of this uh, person, Dr. Wallace J. Nichols, he's a turtle. Dr. J. Dr. J. I candy people. <laughs> <laughs> a really good looking guy. But he's smart, he's creative, he cares. And if you want to read something really interesting, get his book, Blue Mind, B-L-U-E-M-I-N-D. And so I sit on my porch and I get in my blue mind. Yep. Watch that tide that she's changed. It's better than watching the grass. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Alice, tell us about what's around the corner for you. What are you excited about? Well, I'm just literally finished. Um, I wrote another series in the Beach House series, which I, I was, it was time. And we were talking about that earlier. I love that series. And it's going to continue as long as I have something to say about what's going on in the beaches. And it's, I'm really concerned about plastics and microplastics. Mm -hmm. And it's not a very touchy-feely, you know, you can't hug microplastics. But I'm trying to create, it's the continuing saga of the Rutledge family. But through that family, you see how young people are making a difference. Those, you know, 18, 20, 25-year-olds that I really want to engage. And it's called On Ocean Boulevard. And I'm having a lot of fun with it. It'll be out in May. Fantastic. Before I offer you some time for questions, I want Sally to introduce us to a couple of special guests that are in the audience. 